Chapter 4, Miami, Florida. Still dark outside. No traffic. Just me. This is how I like it. Muy tranquilo. I never saw a street sweeper machine in my life until I came to Puerto Rico. The first week here, it woke me up. I was 11. I thought it was a monster. And then I looked out the window and I saw it pass. I saw the man inside. I wondered what he thinks about driving all night in the dark alone. And now I'm driving a street sweeper, maybe the same one. And now I know what the driver thinks, watching the curb, watching parked cars, looking down at the gutter broom, thinking when to use the sprayer, thinking about other times in my life, enjoying the peaceful night. Peace is a very hard thing to find. The Pope is always asking for peace. He tells all the countries to stop their wars. Every year he tells them, but more wars always come. Always people disagree and fight. I think about why this is while I drive. I think about the sheer water bird. It's March. It's still cool at night, like Puerto Rico in the mountains where I lived. The air was cool there. Life was more calm, for a while anyway. And then my father had to sell our farm to a power company. Lots of families had to. They covered our farm with water to make a lake, to make electricity. Many people there were angry. My family left the mountains where we'd always live. We moved to San Juan on the coast. San Juan is a very big city. There were five children in my family. People laughed at how we talked. Boys fought me. Some people laughed at my father's straw hat. Many times I heard my father and mother argue. Other people argued against the government. Some wanted Puerto Rico to join the United States. Others wanted it to be its own country. Others wanted it to be something else. All were fighting against each other. Then one day, a bomb went off near our house. I ran to see, and then I wish I hadn't. I saw a man lying down in his own blood. One month later, we flew in a plane to Miami. No one in my family spoke English. In the mountains, there was only Spanish. In school here, I listened to the teacher, but I didn't understand anything. I would look a long time at her ring and her necklace and her shoes and other students and out the window. That's all I did that first year. The next year, I went to junior high. There was lots to look at in the woodworking class, but my teacher got mad when I didn't look at him. He asked me a question one time. I didn't know what he said, so I didn't say anything back. His face got red. He ran up to my chair and then he grabbed my hair and he lifted me up and he yelled some words in my face. Ooh, I hated that teacher. He didn't know Spanish. When he let me go, I swore at him in Spanish and then I ran out of the room and went home. Next week, they made me take a test and then they said I could move to a different school. I was glad. And then I went there and it was a school for disadvantaged children. That's where they put kids who didn't know English. I told my father I wouldn't go. He said school in America makes your life better. We had lots of arguments. I pretended to go, but instead I would walk around or go to the park or watch the tennis players. When I was 14, I got a job in a restaurant when I was supposed to be in school. I brought home the money. I gave it to my father. I knew he needed it for the rent. He took it. I quit pretending to go to school after that. In the restaurant, I worked at the dishwasher machine. Everyone spoke Spanish. I really liked it there. The waitresses all called me flaco because I was skinny. They used to bring me food. It was a good job. But people argued there too. There were two cooks, one from Puerto Rico. He only liked Puerto Rican salsa. Willie Cologne was his favorite. He fought in tapes of Willie Cologne's band, and he would hit the spatula on the grill like a drum. The other cook was from Jamaica. He only liked reggae. One weekend, there was a third cook from Cuba. They used to fight over the tape player. Not even the Pope could stop this war. Four years I worked there, and then the restaurant closed. I got a job in a different restaurant. Many people spoke English there. I learned how to speak from them. Constancia was one of the waitresses, 18 years old, also from Puerto Rico. She was so beautiful that everyone gave her big tips. Some she would give to the dishwasher and the busboys. She always gave more to me than to the others. We became engaged. Then we got married. That was a very happy time. 
we lived with her mother, Constancia was not only beautiful, but very kind and very good. Every day I told myself that I was lucky. I went to class at night to learn English better, to get a better job. English is very strange. You chop a tree down, and then you chop a tree up. Muy loco. I filled out a form, and I got a job with the city fixing holes in the street. Much more money than from the restaurant. We had a party to celebrate, and at the party, Constancia announced that she was pregnant. Her mother, my mother, my father, everyone was very happy for us. Down that street to the right at the red light is the hospital where the baby was born. A beautiful little girl. Everyone loved her. Constancia stopped working in the restaurant to stay home with the baby. She was a very good mother. When the baby was just one year old, it got a cold. This cold got worse, and then it went into the baby's lungs. It kept coughing and sweating, and then it died. After this, Constancia changed. She didn't go back to work in the restaurant. She missed the baby very much, and instead of hearing the baby's voice, she turned on the TV and let it talk all day long. When she watched, her eyes didn't move. Her face was like one of the statues in church. One year later, we had another baby, this time a boy. We named him Raul. This time, Constancia was different. Instead of laughing and smiling at the baby, she was worried all the time. She was afraid it would get sick like the first baby. Raul learned how to crawl and started putting everything in his mouth. Every day, Constancia would mop the floor, vacuum the rug. She bought a special spray to kill germs. She sprayed it on his toys and the TV and the furniture. In summer, red dust falls on Miami. People say it's from the desert in Africa that the wind blows it across the ocean. Constancia was afraid it would bring bad diseases. She went to a botanica and bought special candles and statues of saints and prayers to hang over Raul's crib. When Raul was four, Constancia's grandmother and grandfather came from Puerto Rico to live in our house. All day, the grandfather played dominoes in our kitchen with the man next door and argued about politics. He also liked to watch soccer on TV. His hearing was bad, so the TV had to be loud. The grandmother was always telling Constancia how to take care of Raul. Feed him more plantain, like in Puerto Rico. French fries are very bad for the stomach. We taught Raul English, but the grandparents didn't like this. We talked to him in English. They talked to him in Spanish. Constancia's mother tried to keep everything peaceful. Impossible. It was like a war in our house. One night on TV, I saw a picture of a bird flying over the ocean. The announcer said the bird lives almost all its life on the ocean. He said it was called a shearwater. I wished I could be that bird, live alone, far away from land, no other birds around, very peaceful. I had a cousin in New Jersey. He moved in with us, 17 years old. Constancia's mother wanted him to leave. He was always playing rock and roll on the radio. He stayed out at night, very late. I saved enough money for a car. The first time he drove it, he had an accident. We had a big argument about it, and then I lost my job. All day, I was home with Raul. I tried to play with him. Constancia wouldn't let him play in the street or even on the sidewalk. He couldn't ride in the car unless he wore a special charm around his neck. I looked for a job, but I couldn't find anything. Our money was getting very low. Constancia started bringing in money by taking care of babies for women who worked. First it was two, then three, then five. There was always a baby crying and a grandparent yelling and the TV loud and the rock and roll loud and everybody arguing until one morning, very early, before it was light, I got in the car and drove. Not driving to look for a job, just driving. I got out of Miami. I drove through the Everglades. Very peaceful. I rolled down the windows. It felt great. I drove two hours across the Gulf. I parked at a beach. I walked out, watched the waves. No one was there. A little breeze off the water. Very quiet. Very nice. After a while, I got hungry. I got back in the car and I drove farther. I came to a town. I walked out on the pier, nailed the wall of a restaurant, was a little marching van made of wood. An arrow under it pointed to the front door and said, March on in. I went in and I ate breakfast. And then I walked to the edge of the pier and it was still early and cool. I saw people getting on a fishing boat. And then I remembered the Shearwater bird. I'd been thinking about it for months now. They said you couldn't see it from land. You have to go on a boat. I asked the captain if he'd ever seen one. He said all the time. I told him I didn't want to fish. I only wanted to see a shear water. He let me on for half price. We left. Everyone else was busy getting their poles ready. Not me. I stood up at the front looking for the bird. 
The captain would stop to let people fish and then start up again. I looked back. I couldn't see land. That felt good. I felt like a sheer water. The sky was clear. The water was calm. We went farther and farther, and then the captain called me. He pointed. Following the boat was a flock of birds diving into the water, fighting over fish, stealing fish from each other. Very noisy. He said those were sheer waters. I watched. I couldn't believe those were the birds I'd been dreaming of. They followed us a long way. I felt sad all the way back to land. I got off the boat. I walked down the pier, and I came to that wooden marching band. I stopped, and I looked. There was a trumpet, trombone, clarinet, and a drum. Birds don't live alone, I told myself. They live in flocks, like people. People are always in a group, like that little wooden band. And whenever there's a group, there's fighting. And if the people in a group get along, maybe they make good music instead of arguing like Willie Colon's band, but usually not. That's how life is. I stared at that marching band, and then I got in the car, and I drove home. That was last year. In summer, I got this job driving the street sweeper, 2 o'clock in the morning until 10, very peaceful during the night. And then the sun comes up, the traffic starts, everyone's in a hurry, cars honk, they go around me, all that will start in an hour. I'm ready for it. I always bring a tape player. I'll put on some music, Willie Colon's band. <laughs>